we're going to move on to our last sort of back-to-back -back lecture and panel discussion. We're going to be talking about ketamine because no one can ever get enough ketamine. And to start us off, I'm going to introduce Dr. Ruben Strayer. He is, he doesn't need an introduction, but here we go. He's a famous emergency medicine physician in the world of FOMED. He also works clinically at Maimonides Medical Center. We are honored and really happy to have you here. So can't wait to hear what you have to say. Hi everyone, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Great. So I'm Ruben Strayer uh, and in a span of 10 minutes, I'm going to explain the reasons and uh, the role of ketamine as a treatment for severe agitation. The reason to use ketamine as a tranquilizing agent, and I use that term very deliberately, is because nothing comes close to matching ketamine's effectiveness for immediately, reliably, and safely allowing clinicians to control a dangerously agitated patient. There are now dozens of studies attesting to this. I've made many of them available at emupdates.com slash calm with a K so that Mark can review them in the next nine minutes before attempting a rebuttal. Ketamine in dissociative doses will cause nearly every patient, uh, regardless of how big, strong, psychotic, uh, intoxicated, or borderline, to become calm and still in about three minutes as they continue to breathe and protect their airway. It doesn't matter whether the patient is intoxicated with alcohol, methamphetamine, cocaine, PCP, from which ketamine is derived, or ketamine itself. If someone uses ketamine recreationally and then becomes a, rage, a raging, mad, dangerous lunatic, ketamine dissociation will make that patient calm and it can be delivered with extraordinary reliability by the intramuscular route with little concern about finding the right dose because of ketamine's unique dose response curve. You can't discuss ketamine for any indication without understanding its effects across its dose spectrum. Ketamine has four phases of effect, analgesia, recreational, partially dissociated, and fully dissociated. At very low dose, ketamine has minimal effect on perception or emotion, but is a powerful analgesic. As the dose increases, the patient will have significant perceptual disturbance uh, but they know what's going on. They can have a mostly normal conversation. And then at higher doses, you enter into partial dissociation where the patient is disconnected from reality, but still conscious. Uh, this is generally where you want your patient not to be. But once you pass the threshold of dissociation, which occurs at about one milligram per kilogram IV or four milligrams per kilogram IM, the patient becomes unconscious, unaware, uninteractive, and still. The flat segment at the end of the spectrum is, is quite important. Once the threshold of full dissociation has been reached, higher doses prolong duration of action but have no additional effect. This feature gives ketamine a remarkable safety profile. You don't have to worry about ketamine overdose. That doesn't really exist. You just have to make sure you've given enough. And enough is a dissociative dose, which will make the patient calm and still and usually breathing and handling their secretions, but not always. And here lies the most important thing to know about ketamine dissociation. Every patient who is dissociated with ketamine for any reason and not already intubated may develop hypoventilation or apnea from a variety of causes and must be monitored with full PSA setup in a resuscitation environment with an airway capable provider at bedside continuously. And that's why it makes sense to intubate these patients if they are delivered to you by EMS and you are a single doc working an overnight shift in a single doc shop, which is what happened in John Cole's often cited study where a significant number of patients got intubated. This study is now often cited in popular media because of what's going on with police and ketamine. Uh, it's very clear and apparent from many other studies and discussions with Dr. Cole himself that nearly all the patients that received dissociative dose ketamine for agitation and get intubated would have done well had they not been intubated. But it is hard for some emergency docs in some settings to stand there and watch a GCS3 patient until they emerge from dissociation. By the way, we would prefer that you use the terminology GCS3K because all dissociated patients will be GCS3, which is why ketamine is not the right agent to manage the routine 
agitated drunk. I've been talking about ketamine for agitation for many years. Uh, I've worked in a variety of New York City hospitals that see a, a lot of agitated patients. And I think I have used ketamine for this indication half a dozen times in 15 years. Whereas I have used haloperidol, droperidol, and midazolam hundreds of times, probably thousands of times for agitation. Ketamine is not to be used for routine agitation. There are two indications to use ketamine for agitation. Firstly, for the patient who is uncontrollably violent, meaning almost always a big, strong man who is intoxicated, cannot be safely subdued by available resources, and is therefore an immediate threat to himself or others from the agitation and violence itself. The second type of patient is very agitated, but you also have a high concern for a dangerous medical condition that requires immediate management. The most common example is the agitated polytrauma patient, but this also applies to an agitated patient with a temp of 106 or an agitated patient with a saturation of 50%, ripping off his face mask. These are patients where you do not have time to calm them down with a drug that may or may not work. You need to establish control immediately or they will die. Which brings me to the ketamine tranquilization litmus test, where you ask yourself, if this patient that I'm considering using ketamine to sedate, if this patient ends up intubated, would that be reasonable care? If yes, great. But for 99% of agitated patients in the emergency department, the answer is going to be no. And so for 99% of emergency agitation, you should use a conventional titratable sedative like droperidol, haloperidol, or midazolam. I generally prefer a combination of droperidol or, hal or haloperidol and midazolam, depending on what's going on. And this will work very well most of the time. But depending on the doses, you have to accept that it might not work immediately and that you might have to redose to get your patient calm. For the, butorphan for the butorphanone neuroleptics, you have to accept a delayed onset of action, especially with haloperidol. And you have to accept the side eye that you're going to get from toxicologists and pharmacologists because of the theoretical risk of QT prolongation or lowering the seizure threshold, uh, though these concerns are, are really vastly overblown. Toxicologists love midazolam. Mark loves midazolam. I also love midazolam and three to five milligrams of IM Versed will safely and effectively manage most agitated patients, but you will run into problems on both ends of the therapeutic window with midaz because the therapeutic window is relatively narrow. The problem with using midazolam as a single agent for routine agitation, most of which is alcohol related, is that at doses that are reliably safe, two, three, four milligrams, it's not reliably effective. And at doses that are reliably effective, like five, six, seven milligrams, it's not reliably safe. You will absolutely see dangerous respiratory depression at the higher doses, especially with alcohol on board. So be careful with higher doses of midazolam. So my take home message, is that ketamine is rarely the right agent to manage agitation in the ED. But when it is the right agent, it is essential. So know when to use it, uncontrollable violence and severe agitation with high concern for a dangerous condition. Know how to use it safely, which is in a full PSA setup. And get good at using droperidol, haloperidol, and midazolam for everyone else. Thanks for your attention. All right, over to you, Mark. Thank you, Dr. Strayer. I'm going to introduce our next lecturer. That's Dr. Sue. He's going to be talking about a different approach to ketamine and some different thoughts behind ketamine. He is an NYC famous toxicologist at the director, and he's also the director of the New York City Poison Control Center. He is the associate professor at NYU School of Medicine. So let's welcome him, and I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Excellent. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Frosel. I'd like to also thank the all New York City EM group for inviting me to speak on this very interesting subject. And I appreciate Ruben Strayer for the introduction to the topic and the sharing of those references at the beginning of his talk. Um, so all of us work in extremely chaotic and very busy emergency departments. There are things going on all the time, a million things happening, helicopters flying in, people running around, lots of things. So we work in very busy and a very chaotic environment. And that's what just what we do in emergency medicine. One of our main goals and objectives during almost any of our shifts in emergency medicine is to empty out the ED completely and not have any patients. Of course, uh, that's not really true. Uh, but if there are any patients, we'd like them to be happy and resting 
as comfortably as possible. So the reality is that this type of placid and calm and quiet environment doesn't happen in the emergency department. We have patients. We have patients who are acutely ill. We have patients that require attention and many of them require immediate attention. So this is most certainly the case when it comes to patients with agitation. And as Ruben described, patients who have excited delirium and extreme forms of agitation. So the excited delirium syndrome is characterized by catecholamine excess, metabolic acidosis, multi-system organ failure, altered mental status, hyperthermia. It's a life-threatening emergency. This is a life-threatening emergency that we encounter much like a STEMI gunshot wound to the chest. If the patient doesn't receive immediate attention, they could suffer severe adverse sequelae, they could even die, and they need to be sedated and stabilized very quickly. So fortunately, as Ruben discussed in his talk, we have a lot of options. We have several options that we can use to sedate these patients, including the drugs that are listed in this table. So you see here, as Ruben discussed already, that there are basically three classes of medications that we can use. Benzodiazepines, antipsychotic medications, and ketamine. Interestingly, in this systematic review, you see that ketamine had received, has received the most attention in terms of formal research. Now, since time is of the essence in most of these patients, in fact, mo all these patients with agitation, we need a medication that has a rapid onset. And so you can see here in this table that both midazolam and ketamine both have a very rapid onset. Ketamine might be slightly faster, according to some other studies, we're talking seconds here, but in general, both of, the, both of them are very fast. But onset isn't the only thing that's important. The duration effect needs to be considered as well. So Ruben talks about midazolam requiring additional, um, additional doses, but ketamine is so short acting that ketamine often requires additional dosing as well. So I don't think that's a, a, a property that's unique to midazolam. And in fact, it is often noted with ketamine. And this is important when we're sending patients to CT scan and doing other things and sending them out of the emergency department. So we know that ketamine is great for procedural sedation. It helps us to avoid having to do less, the less than ideal maneuvers to accomplish what would otherwise be a simple procedure. In this case, we have a young kid who's getting a, a forehead laceration. So ketamine is very useful for that. But when it comes to agitation and excited delirium, this is not the controlled setting of procedural sedation. And ketamine is not the best drug for this setting. There are many disadvantages to the use of ketamine and let's count the ways. So in terms of pharmacology, ketamines are dirty. It's a promiscuous drug that affects many different receptor types in the body, as I've listed here. Some of these receptors include the NMDA receptor, sigma receptor, the cholinergic receptor, a bunch of different receptors. Activation of these multiple receptors can lead to unpredictable and potentially harmful side effects. So when it comes to these side effects, it's important to, to recognize these, and there are many listed here. Some of these, they're not so important, right? So little secretions, vomiting, not such a big deal. But when you look at these other complications that are associated with ketamine, these are a big deal. The need for intubation, laryngospasm, increased heart rate, blood pressure, and the potential exacerbation of psychosis. The list is quite long. And in fact, in a paper written by Rubin in 2008 regarding the use of ketamine for procedural sedation, he writes in this paper, and I'm just going to read what he writes, what's in the paper, ketamine causes centrally mediated catecholamine reuptake inhibition that generally results in a modest increase in heart rate and an elevation of blood pressure, which on occasion can be marked. Furthermore, however, whereas the stimulation of cardiac output is an advantage in the hypotensive patient, I recognize that, the resulting increase in myocardial oxygen demand can be consequential. And in patients known for or at risk for coronary artery disease, caution is prudent. Does that sound safe? I'm not so sure. So now when it comes to psychiatric disease and patients with schizophrenia, a large proportion of patients presenting for the ED with agitation or excited delirium can't provide an adequate history and they could have underlying psychiatric disease. As depicted here. Now, ketamine has been shown to exacerbate psychosis in patients with underlying schizophrenia. And as the second paper shows you, this is even demonstrated at low doses. 
So ketamine would not be the right choice of sedation in these agi agitated patients for this reason. So now let's get to the elephant in the room, ketamine and intubation. Ruben says the ketamine is very safe and not associated with many airway complications. I beg to differ. So I myself love the Pittsburgh Steelers and a good intubation. It's such a nice feeling to get a good look at the cords and pass that ET tube through right, right, right through them. And in fact, I enjoy intubating so much that the last time I did it was on a Wednesday conference day back when the residents used to go to conference when all the residents were at conference. That day I was working with my co-attending, Rana Biari. Patient came into the hospital, obtunded, altered mental status, GCS was less than eight, and the patient clearly needed intubation. So I literally pushed my friend and co-attending, Rana Biari, away from the head of the bed just to do the tube. Luckily I got it and Rana and I are still friends. But seriously, probably the most important reason why not to use ketamine in the setting of agitation is because of the requirement for intubation. In this study by John Cole, John Cole has done a lot of great work on this topic, looking at pre-hospital use of ketamine for agitation. They had a whopping intubation rate of 63%. 63%, that is an extremely high number. Now, one could argue that this was a single study. This was a pre-hospital setting. I've spoken to John Cole myself personally too, and it seems to potentially have been driven by a single provider. Now, looking at this meta-analysis by John Cole and colleagues, looking at ketamine use in the settings of aeromedical transport, EMS, and in the ED, the overall intubation rate was lower, but still 197 out of 645 patients, or 30.5% of them, got intubated. That's a very large number. So now you might say agitation, patients with agitation and excited delirium are sick. And as Ruben described, it may be acceptable to intubate this many patients. But I would just counter this argument by saying that intubation is not benign and all the patients that, of all the patients that we see in the ED, typically less than 1% of them should require intubation. So this very high rate of intubation that we see with ketamine can't, uh, must be considered and it can't be discounted. And so otherwise, if we continue to use ketamine routinely, we're gonna be filling our busy EDs with patients who get intubated as a complication of sedation. And finally, just to illustrate that ketamine associated airway complications can also occur in a delayed fashion. In this case that we received recently, a patient presented to the hospital uh, with, uh, he was 38 years old, he was hypotensive, tachypnic and hypothermic with altered mental status. He was given ketamine 100 milligrams IV six times, 600 milligrams, and then an additional 200 milligrams IV for CT scan. He desatted, that initially those desats improved with Larson to Larson's maneuver, but over the next five hours, he subsequently, subsequently had three airway calls, which initially were improved and treated with suction, that was fine, but by the third time, he had jaw clenching that prevented adequate suction, and ultimately he was intubated. So this is just a single case, but this is reported with ketamine that there is a need for delayed airway intervention after administration. And then, mind you, the last dose of ketamine in this particular example was five hours, uh, five hours after, five, he got intubated five hours after his last dose. So as Ruben mentioned, he knows me well. So we see that my, pre my preference is benzodiazepines. And so we look at this study here that shows, that compares midazolam versus some antipsychotics, olanzapine, zeprazidone, and haloperidol for treating acute agitation in the emergency department. What do we see? Midazolam, one out of 127 patients are intubated. Benzodiazepines are predictable, they're rapid at onset, and they have fewer side effects. Looking at this particular study, in which the combination of midazolam and droperidol for, for, for sedation was compared to some other antipsychotics, and not just midazolam alone, there were some adverse airway events, but these were corrected easily and they had a 0% intubation rate with the midazolam droperidol combination. So, benzodiazepines have fewer side effects compared to ketamine. They're more predictable. They're associated with lower rates of intubation. And as we always say in toxicology, when are benzodiazepines ever bad? So, benzodiazepines are your friend. Ketamine is not in this setting. Remember, all of us, we work in very busy and chaotic emergency departments that have patients. We wanna minimize chaos and ideally we want everyone to be resting comfortably and not intubated. So 
I thank you for your attention. I thank all the present and future toxicologists who provide me with the material and inspiration for this talk. And uh, I welcome the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sue. I'm going to invite our panel member. She does not need any introduction. Uh, Dr. Beck Esme is going to join us. She is an all NYC faculty member. She is the assistant residency director at Mount Sinai Morningside West, editor in chief of Feminem, associate editor of Rebel EM, and a frequent contributor to the MRAP podcast series. So I'm excited to let you take over from here, Dr. Beck Esme, and uh, let's get to the discussion. Hi. Thank you, everyone. Um, I am very much looking forward to this discussion because a lot of what I learned about sedating agitated patients, I have learned personally from Dr. Schreyer or Dr. Sue, or actually even from Dr. Cole, who was my attending when I was a medical student at HCMC and regions in the Twin Cities area. So this is a very fun topic for me. Um, I think you guys really pulled out a lot of nuances between these. The first question I have for you that I want us to discuss and, and um, audience members, please feel free to add things to the uh, question chat so we can make sure to answer your questions. But I wanna know how you guys are doing this in practicality. I think you made some good arguments in favor of various medications, but are you going for pinning down a patient and giving them an IV? Are you stabbing them through their genes with an IM? Um, a lot of times nurses will say that these volumes of medications are gonna to be too high to be given at IM. Is there any max that you can be giving for any of these medications? Can you tell me what this actually looks like when a patient is going crazy and destroying your recess room? I'll take a first stab at it. Um, so uh, again, just wanna reemphasize that uh, the vast majority of patients who come in agitated should not be receiving ketamine as a treatment for agitation for many of the reasons that Mark just elucidated. Um, but for the occasional patient who requires immediate tranquilization um, for a high degree of danger, um, the right thing to do is to assemble the uh, amount, amount of force that you need to control the patient. That's as many, usually big, strong men as you can throw at the patient, uh, ideally one for the head, one for each extremity, not including the nurse uh, who's drawing up and administering the medication, not including the physician who's orchestrating the resuscitation or uh, the takedown, if you will. Uh, but a, a lot of people show a force. Uh, you'd like to um, apply face mask oxygen uh, to, that, to that patient. You'd like to make sure there's no dangerous restraint holds uh, in play. Uh, so if uh, there is a hog tie that some, some of our patients might come in in a hog tie, or at least they used to, we don't do that very much anymore, thankfully. If someone is compressing the neck or the chest, if someone is covering up the mouth with a gloved hand, which often happens uh, when these patients might be spitting, uh, you wanna make sure you deal with all of that first. And then uh, as soon as feasible, after the patient is um, held down, you wanna deliver the appropriate um, medication, in, in this case, ketamine, if someone really needs it, um, I, through the clothes intramuscularly. Definitely don't wanna uh, try to start an IV. Uh, that's a very dangerous uh, uh, because uh, starting an IV is, is hard on someone who's thrashing about and the delays associated with starting an IV on these patients uh, are, could be much better spent, that time is much better spent just waiting for the patient to calm down after an IM shot. Trying to start an IV exposes your nurses uh, to needle stick risk, bad idea. The last uh, point has to do with volume and depending on the ketamine concentration that, that you have in your department, you could run into trouble with volume. There's a lot of nursing protocols that uh, limit volumes uh, for intramuscular injection to five cc's. However, there is a fair amount of, of evidence that you can give much more than that without, without trouble. Certainly 10 cc's, actually up to 20 or 30 cc's is safe. You may have trouble getting your nurses to do that. So uh, I've had that happen to me once and I just took the syringe myself and, and gave uh, all, of the, all of the medication into the thigh. Uh, and that's my approach. I have two comments on that before I talk uh, toss it back over to Dr. Sue. First, um, I think that the point about there's a delay on either end, whether you're putting in an IV or you're waiting for the IM medications to work is a really good one. I think often we'll hear people say, sometimes from the nursing staff, sometimes, sometimes from the physician staff, oh, if we give it IM, we have to sit here for so long. There is always at least five to 10 minutes of wrangling someone down, getting an arm ready, then you'll get the IV and it, come, it goes flying when the patient gets loose. Um, so I think you're right that waiting on the medication is already been administered and is probably safer. Um, what was the second thing? Oh, the second thing was regarding volume. I, if you have to, you can split into two syringes, mm -hmm. two providers, both thighs through the, through the genes if you need to. I've seen that done. 
to great success. Uh, Dr. Su, did you have anything to add to your technique for how this happens in practicality? I just wanted to say, I think Ruben emphasized this, but we mentioned this, but I think the, the emphasis here uh, should be on provider safety. These patients are risk to not only themselves, but to staff and they could be swinging and potentially hurting staff. And so this is a, this is a very serious emergency. This requires hospital security and as many large people as you can get available to physically restrain these people until they can get the chemical sedation. And typically IM is, is, is the safest way because uh, as, as Ruben mentioned, the, the needle sticks associated, potential needle sticks with IV uh, are posed additional unnecessary risks. I think one of the really challenging things with these patients is the redosing of medications and when to combine medications, when to switch medications, how long to wait. So let's just take it kind of one circumstance at a time. It sounds like both of you agree for the standard agitated patient, it's not going to be ketamine. It's going to be potentially a benzo with a combination of a benzo alone, a benzo with an antipsychotic or potentially an antipsychotic alone. You've given that IM, how long do you wait? What is your initial dose that you like to give? What is your cocktail or combination you like to give? And then what do you switch to if those things are not working? Um, so just to reemphasize that using ketamine in this context is only for the initial um, gaining control of the patient. Uh, once uh, this is like, so you're confronted with a patient who is very dangerously agitated, you, you think it's a very high priority to gain immediate control. You don't want to take the chance that you might need to redose. That's where ketamine strengths uh, come into play. And uh, I would submit that once you get the patient under control with, with ketamine, you're going to try to then move on to address the underlying problem. You may not know what the underlying problem is at the outset, but someone comes in throwing stretchers across the triage area, uh, you can take control of that patient very effectively with ketamine. That patient needs to be put on a recess monitor. Uh, that's when you get your line. That's when you get your, a better history, try to figure out what's going on. And then you're going to tailor your further therapies to the underlying problem, which could be um, a cocaine intox. It could be alcohol withdrawal. It could be schizophrenia. Whatever it is, you're going to try to tailor your therapies uh, to that. And you're going to be ready to redose um, with ketamine, as Mark said, it's not long acting. So even IM ketamine is going to start to uh, disappear in 15-ish minutes, maybe 30 minutes. Uh, and so you need to be prepared to redose. But in my experience, and I think that the literature bears this out, uh, these patients generally emerge from ketamine tranquilization in a, gradually and, and in a, a somewhat calmer state than when they came in. And you generally have time and you have an IV. Uh, and again, more history, you have your drugs ready. It's generally not a problem to maintain uh, control over those patients. I'll let Mark comment on his uh, approach then. So just to reiterate that, mm -hmm. ketamine is to get them down when they're going crazy. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to tailor your medications potentially with a benzo or an antipsychotic if it's cocaine or alcohol withdrawal or psychosis, that's the underlying problem, to actually keep them down for longer if you need more than that 15, 20 minutes. Exactly. I don't think redosing ketamine um, for ongoing agitation is the right approach which is what happened in that case that Mark, or that Dr. Right. Sue showed, was mm -hmm. repeated doses of ketamine that led to this problem. Dr. Mm -hmm. Sue, do you want to comment? Yeah, so typically my approach would be monotherapy with a benzodiazepine. My preferred benzodiazepine is going to be midazolam. I'm going to typically give five or 10 milligrams intramuscularly to the patients. I'll wait a few minutes, maybe five, 10 minutes. If they need to be redosed, I will go back with more midazolam, maybe another five to 10. And, and again, reassess in about five or 10 minutes. If they need more, I might try maybe another five or 10. This is just kind of based on anecdotal personal evidence. And at that point, if I'm not gaining adequate sedation, I'm probably gonna go to potentially other GABAergic agents to, uh, to facilitate or to, um, to help uh, such something like Atomidate. And maybe in some cases, I would use a, a little bit of an opioid like fentanyl, something to give me rapid sedation of the patient to where I can get an IV into the patient. And at that point, once I get the IV established, I'm going to give them longer sedation, longer acting benzodiazepines, not midazolam because it's too short acting. So midazolam, five to 10 milligrams IM times two, spaced out by 10-ish minute, yeah, minutes, five to 10 minutes. Yeah. Five to 10 are the good numbers for you. And then once you've done that twice, you're adding on some other medication. 
Probably. I will note specifically that you did not say any of the antipsychotics. Do you want to give us a toxicologist's comment on the antipsychotics in the undifferentiated agitated patient? Uh, uh, the antipsychotics, have all of them typically have a longer onset of sedation. And although their, their duration effect is quite prolonged, I need somebody sedated immediately. And for that sedation, if I need that sedation immediate, the antipsychotics are not going to help me in that very acute um, acute need for sedation in the minutes, as opposed to the, the half hour or hour later or when the patient still needs sedation, but it's less important because I have an IV and I, I can give other medications as well. Um, Dr. Strayer, this, well, this is actually a good one for both of you. Uh, it's coming from Kevin Molyneux in the chat. He's asking, is there any concern about PCP and ketamine both working on the NMD, NMDA receptor, or is this generally not ultimately clinically relevant? I guess his question is coming from the fact that those patients that are generally throwing stretchers around could be on PCP. So are you at all hesitant to use this in those situations? I think that these are the patients that honestly are most in need of uh, ketamine tranquilization. Um, and uh, actually, uh, my uh, department just published a case series just a couple days ago um, around an electronic dance music festival, um, which included using ketamine to um, to sedate patients who were intoxicated with recreational dose um, ketamine. So the, as I mentioned, the answer for severe agitation associated with PCP um, or, or ketamine done recreationally um, is the same as severe agitation from any cause. Um, if you need to get the patient down right now, you don't wanna take the chance that you might have to redose, then um, the, the ketamine will work for sort of whatever ails you. You don't have to be concerned about um, too much NMDA uh, activity. Uh, these patients will become dissociated, calm, and still, unlike a procedural sedation patients who will see an increase in heart rate and blood pressure, these patients are on sympathetic overdrive. And what will happen uh, with ketamine, and we know this pretty clearly from the literature now, is that they will see a normalization of their vital signs uh, in marked distinction to the relatively calm patient who gets a PSA dose of ketamine who becomes hypertensive tachycardic. These already very hypertensive tachycardic patients will see a normalization of their vital signs with ketamine. How about in the pre-hospital setting? Um, in some practice environments, paramedics or, or medics will have various degrees of airway capabilities. Do you think that this is a safe medication for them to be using in the extremely agitated patient pre-hospital? Uh, I would say that um, only, only providers who have the capability to do advanced airway management should be um, using ketamine in dissociative doses because of the risk of hypoventilation and apnea that is always present um, whenever ketamine is given in dissociative doses. So I don't recommend um, that providers who don't have the capacity to uh, intubate use dissociative dose ketamine. This is always sort of uh, region by region and every pre-hospital um, service has their own culture, but giving, giving dissociative dose ketamine to a patient without the capability to manage their airway um, is, uh, is a recipe for, for problems. I'd just like to add here, um, Jenny, that uh, I've been in correspondence with John Cole recently, and uh, he says that uh, at his medical center, you know, the paper I quoted of his study with 63%, of course, that's an extreme example. Um, but he says that they still have a, a relatively high intubation rate of somewhere around 25% in the pre-hospital setting. And because of that, I, I, I have concerns about the use of ketamine. I have large concerns about using ketamine in the pre-hospital setting. Yeah. Okay, we have one minute left, so I want to hold both of your feet to the fire. Dr. Sue, is there any agitated circumstance in which you would use ketamine? You've given midazolam a few times. You've given some, some uh, opiate or something else. Would you ever pull the trigger on using ketamine? Have you done it? I have not. I have not. I haven't done it. Um, I guess the answer to this question to me would be is if I've exhausted all of my typical medications that I give for acute agitation and the patient is still not in control and not adequately sedated and still a threat to himself or to others, potentially at that point I will try ketamine. Okay. Dr. Strayer, is there any dangerously acutely agitated patient, the extreme type patient that you're talking about using ketamine for, in whom you would not use this? Is there any circumstance that's the exception for you? 
Yeah. So if I know that the issue is, for example, cocaine intox, um, and uh, I, I feel like I have adequate personnel, then I have no problem with giving someone 10 to 20 milligrams of midazolam, which is sort of a antidote for um, stimulant induced uh, uh, agitation. Um, that said, if you just, it's the ben some people are benzodiazepine resistant and you just need to have that uh, sort of ace in the pocket ready, which will work uh, essentially every time um, if the patient becomes uncontrollable. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone.